this time we are talking about section topic 2.5 of the cultural consequences of connectivity. So this whole uh, this whole unit uh, uh, topic two is all about trade, and now we're kind of getting into some some large scale uh, consequences of that trade. Um, and we're going to really start with the diffusion of different religions, um, starting with um, starting with Buddhism uh, in East Asia. Okay, for, so for those of you who don't remember, um, Buddhism becomes quite popular in East Asia um, after its uh, travel um, from the Silk Roads, or excuse me, via the Silk Roads from its original uh, origin, uh, which is India, right? Um, <clears throat> and especially the Buddhist monk Xuanzang, Xuanzang uh, helps make it very popular by going over there and bringing back a lot of texts uh, that they can um, kind of use to translate. Um, and so um, we start to see Buddhist monks uh, related in particular to the already popular uh, Taoism, uh, kind of using Taoist terminology to help make Buddhism a little more familiar, but also a little more Chinese, uh, especially because with the Chinese concept of the Middle Kingdom, right? That is very beneficial for them to do so. <clears throat> okay, so um, on top of this, we also see uh, Buddhism and Taoism kind of fused to create a syncretic version of Buddhism uh, known as Chan Buddhism, also known as Zen Buddhism. Okay, which is very much a kind of Chinese, uh, 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 unique Chinese Buddhism, right? Um, and so we see a lot of uh, people not too happy with Buddhism in China, especially again, because of this concept of a non-Chinese religion becoming important in China is not something people are too happy about. Um, and so when we, as, as the popularity grows, right, uh, of Buddhism, especially in China, what we start to see then is we see the Confucian scholars, the scholar gentry, Right, stop to adopt, start to adopt it for themselves. Right, um, and and start to kind of create this this idea that Confucians can also be uh, Buddhists as well. Right, uh, printing also increased the popularity uh, of Buddhism, as of course many Buddhist texts were able to be spread uh, throughout the country. Right, um, and then also um, they also started to write in vernacular languages as well. Um, as opposed to kind of the more formal Chinese written languages, uh, which really helped its popularity as well as increased the popularity of the vernacular languages. So um, these are all mostly in China, right? Um, yeah. So the China then spreads it um, uh, from. Um, let's go and get another color here. Uh, well, that's our kind of our yeah. Uh, uh, it spread it from China uh, to its kind of satellite tributary states, or at least satellite uh, states that are not necessarily tributaries, but certainly heavily influenced um, by um, by Chinese culture, specifically uh, Japan and Korea. Okay, um, and in Korea, uh, what we see is that the uh, elites practice Confucianism. Uh, but what we see then is that the commoners, right, the peasants, um, uh, are attracted to Buddhism, which again makes sense because um, the Buddhist ideas of kind of spiritual equality, right, um, and this lack of class structure in it is very appealing to lower class people, uh, as we've seen in India already. Okay, um, <clears throat> so... Um, we see Japan adopt it as well and kind of just uh, uh, embrace it along with Shinto, right? Um, another thing that occurs here uh, is the um, uh, kind of creation of Neo-Confucianism. All right, so Neo-Confucianism being a blend of, of, um, of, of Confucianism and Buddhism, right? Um, in the kind of Taoist ideas that, that Buddhism picked up as well. Right, it's a lot of it. It, it kind of takes the the disparate ideas of both, right? With Confucianism being very much a like 
practical philosophy and a political philosophy rather than a religion. Uh, and these spiritual ideas of Taoism and Buddhism kind of fuse them together, right? Um, the the rational the rational thoughts of of Confucianism, right? Right. The idea of like relationships are important uh, and stuff like that. Um, and then the spirituality of Buddhism and Taoism, right? The idea of like kind of especially becoming in tune with nature, right? Become pretty important, right? Um, and then also becomes the official Korean ideology as well, right? It's showing again how important uh, uh, Chinese culture is in other places, right? All right, so that is the spread of Buddhism and then it's kind of after effects. Um, we also see the spread of Hinduism and Buddhism, uh, especially um, in Southeast Asia. So India, South Asia really making its presence felt religiously uh, during this time period in, in, in different regions, right? Um, so um, just a couple, just to kind of couple, a list off a couple uh, states, the Sri Vijaya Kingdom uh, on Sumatra uh, is a Hindu kingdom, right? Um, the Majapahit uh, uh, kingdom, which is a little bit later, uh, practices Buddhism. Okay. Um, and then we see uh, the Sinhala dynasty in Sri Lanka uh, is a center for Buddhist learning. Uh, and then on top of that, they also have Buddhist advisors to uh, the rulers. All right. Showing how, how deeply important Buddhism is to the kingdom, right? Um, so, um, and then we see, uh, yeah, we'll just add Buddhist advisors over here. Okay. Um, and then, uh, the most successful of the Southeast Asian kingdoms of the time, the Khmer dynasty, right? The Khmer empire, uh, in Cambodia, um, they have, they have the, the monuments at Angkor Thom, uh, which is, um, which shows both Buddhist and Hindu uh, influence. Okay. Um, and then, um, so they started out Hindu. Um, they added kind of Hindu artwork and sculptures of the gods. Uh, and then later on, they would add Buddhist sculptures and artwork as well to the kind of, um, to the, to the uh, facades of Angkor Thom and of course, uh, Angkor Wat. Okay, um, and then we have uh, the spread of Islam into Southeast Asia. All right, which also kind of gets a lot of its roots from South Asia, but not not exclusively this time, right? Um, or sorry, let's let's back up a little bit. This is not just about Southeast Asia. This is the spread of Islam kind of globally, uh, and there's a lot going on here. Um, we have three major regions um, that we want to kind of mention here. Uh, with the spread of Islam. First off, we want to talk about Africa, right? Um, and kind of some examples here of that spread, right? They talk about, um, let's see here, how do we want to do this? Let's go, let's go like this. Okay, uh, so we see the Swahili language uh, on the Swahili coast, um, which is a blend of Bantu and Arabic. Okay. Um, and then we also see Timbuktu in West Africa. So on the opposite side of Africa, uh, become a center of Islamic learning. Right again, so this isn't necessarily causes, this is just like effects and, and kind of showing how important it is, right? Um, and then we see uh, pilgrimages to Mecca as well, especially for Mansa Musa, right? Um, we also see it occur in South Asia uh, by many different routes, mostly by conquests. Uh, but but other ones as well, right? Um, we see um, the kind of decline in Buddhism due to the arrival of, of Islam, right? Kind of um, replaces Buddhists' role in the lower castes, right? Uh, again, because it has the uh, kind of spiritual equality that people like. Uh, Buddhism uh, was an, on decline, not only because of the role of Islam, but also because of the growing corruption of the Buddhist monks, or at least the appearance of that corruption, right? Um, we see uh, architecture blend Hinduism and Hindu and Islamic patterns, which we'll especially see with the Taj Mahal later on. 
Um, I'm not going to focus too much on that. Uh, the language of Urdu, right? The language of Urdu becomes quite important, um, which um, has it's a, it's a kind of a blend of of Sanskrit, uh, Arabic, and Farsi, right? The Persian language of Farsi. Um, so it's a syncretic language, right? Um, and then we also have the Baktic cults, uh, kind of trying to blend uh, Islam and Hinduism together, right? Trying to link the two, uh, uh, sometimes successfully, but for the most part, you know, you don't see the Baktic cults take over as the major religion of South Asia. So, so not quite super, super successful, right? Uh, and then lastly, um, Southeast Asia. Okay, uh, so Southeast Asia, right? Um, we're especially gonna be looking at uh, Malacca, right? They talk about the, the rulers on Java, right? But we see the, the definitely the, the, the Strait of Malacca, the Malacca Empire um, really embrace that idea uh, and also fuses it uh, with, uh, you know, Buddhism and Neo-Confucian ideas, or excuse me, Confucian ideas to kind of create this, uh, again, another uh, syncretic version of, of religions, right? And they talk, talk about the kind of the poetry and the, or the puppetry, which I'm not going to necessarily focus too, too much on here. Okay, so those are kind of the major religious changes that occur um, due to the uh, connectivity of this era. And for Islam, let's not forget that they've already spread throughout many different regions, right? Kind of in the previous era, we talked about especially that had already spread through North Africa, obviously the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula, um, and then uh, Southwest Asia kind of at large, and then even Europe into Spain, right? So they've already been, you know, they've already had a lot of stuff we're just not actually talking about, okay? Um, the spread of science, right? The spread of science and technology, Okay, it's kind of our next big thing here. Okay, so we have a lot of, of science, scientific innovations that are spread, right? Um, so kind of one of the one of the go-to ones they talk about, right, is the is the Greek writings of the Greek philosophers uh, are translated into Arabic, right, to kind of preserve these these very important philosophical ideas that came out of Greece, right? Um, we also see um, uh, mathematics uh, from India, uh, and then also uh, printmaking from China, right? Paper making for, from China, right? Um, and all of these are kind of all from into the uh, Muslim world, right? Into Dar al-Islam, okay? Um, we also see uh, uh, medicine advancements. They talk about, uh, uh, you know, not just from one area, right? They talk about the Greeks, Mesopotamians, and Egyptians all studied medicine. Um, and But they also really focus, the, the Muslims themselves really focuses on hospitals and surgery, right? It's kind of major developments of the era, okay? Um, and so again, these are all kind of into the uh, Muslim world, right? Uh, Dar al-Islam. Um, so we also see uh, the spread of champa rice, uh, champa rice from Vietnam uh, to uh, China. Uh, uh, sorry, from India originally. Um, man, I've been told for years that it was originally from 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 Vietnam. All right. So just another example of that massive Indian influence. Right. And as as we see. Uh, Champa rice grow, right? We see an increase in population, right? Which leads to, um, let me get an arrow there, actually. Uh, which leads to um, an increase in kind of urbanization, uh, an increase in cities, uh, but as well as industrial development, right? Um, and then such as porcelain, silk and steel, uh, and iron as well, right? Um, Okay, we see paper making reach Europe, right, which is going to be pretty important, uh, especially as major religious uh, 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 changes are about to occur with help from the, the printing press, right? Um, and that also leads to an increase in literacy, which is going to really change the economy going forward in Europe, okay? Of course, we have our naval technologies. Cannot forget, we kind of have our four big naval techs of the time. 
And there's certainly more. Uh, they did not talk about like water type bulkheads and stuff, but that's all right. Uh, the triangular sails, uh, which we especially see on the dows and the junks, right? Kind of our two major ships of the era, right? Uh, the dows being the, the Indian Ocean ships that are very small, but very maneuverable and quick. Junks being the massive Chinese, almost treasure boats, right? The stern rudder, which allows for easier navigation, right? Uh, easier kind of uh, control of the ship, right? The astrolabe, which has been around for a while, but we saw Muslims kind of innovate the, the idea. Uh, and then, of course, certainly not last or not least, uh, the magnetic compass It is last, right? But um, we also see um, we also see kind of ast astronomical ideas, right? Which really goes along with the astrolabe or compass. But I'm not going to get into too much detail there. Uh, and of course, one of the biggest uh, um, innovations of the time, right? Gunpowder uh, and guns uh, from China, mostly via the Mongols. Right, the Mongols are kind of well known, well regarded as the major spreaders of gunpowder technology. Right, um, they then kind of talk about the 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 city of Hangzhou here for a second. Um, okay, um, which is we get a lot of knowledge about Hangzhou uh, from Marco Polo. Right, there's a, a million people in the city at this point, which is uh, incredibly massive. Um, it's the center of culture. Uh, in southern China, in the Song Dynasty. Okay, um, and it and it shows. Uh, it's also not only a a center of culture; it's also a center of trade, which tend to go hand in hand, right? The idea of being a cultural center and a trade center, right? It's pretty pretty typical. Um, and it's it's a center of trade because it's at the very southern end of the Grand Canal, right? Um, and they kind of compare it to Novgorod and Timbuktu and Calicut. Um, and so uh, it prospers as trade prospers. Okay, trade cities are pretty important for the college board, for the AP test. They really see it as kind of a growing cultural exchange, right? Um, and then it uh, brings lots of diversity as well, uh, especially uh, with Arabic Muslims um, moving into the city, right? And so it's kind of just throw out here, right? They compared it to Novgorod in Russia, right to Timbuktu in West Africa, uh, and then they also compared it to uh, Calicut in South Asia. Okay. Um, they talked about other cities uh, that thrived due to trade, uh, specifically Kashgar uh, and Samarkand on the Silk Roads. Okay. Um, they were both known as centers of Islamic scholarship. Okay. Um, and then um, they were also kind of these oasis towns um, that had lots of food, lots of fresh water, right? And lots of uh, ability to, um, uh, lots of ability to practice your own independent religions. Uh, Kashgar particularly though declines. Uh, we see uh, conquests by uh, nomadic groups. Uh, specifically by uh, a man by the name of Tamerlane. Uh, and in fact, Tamerlane makes Samarkand his capital, right? Um, so that leads to kind of a decline of the of the major oasis towns, right? Um, they even brought up uh, Constantinople during this time period, which is probably the biggest trade, one of the biggest trade cities in the world at this time, right? Is is ravaged by invaders. They talked about, you know. Um, the Crusaders, right? The Crusades, uh, big invaders there. Uh, the Fourth Crusade in particular. Uh, the Black Plague will hit it, which we haven't really talked too much about. We're about to, though. Uh, the Black Plague, and then finally defeated by the Ottomans uh, in 1453, which is definitely a date to remember. Um, but there's a reason that this era ends around 1450, and that is most likely because of this, right? Okay. Um, and they kind of talk about how, you know, uh, the end of the high middle ages here. Okay. So we talked about all these cities though. And, and so what are the factors of, of city growth? Let's get a different color in here. I'm tired of seeing the, the white, um, the factors of city growth during this time period. Okay. So they got a few here, right? Um, so, uh, political stability is important. Uh, political stability also tends to come from a lack of invasions, 
which we saw a lot of times happen because during this era because of the rise of the Mongols, right? People, you know, people like the Mongols would tend to, the Central Asian nomads would tend to be the people who would be likely to invade. And now that the Mongols are in charge, people are too scared to do it themselves. Um, and that political stability creates safe and reliable transportation, right? Um, and then we also, with the safe transportation, right, we see an increase in commerce, which is what we just call trade, right? Um, you have a large labor supply, okay, lots of people. Um, and then lastly, an increase in farming output really helps these cities grow as well, right? Because when you have more farming, you have more specialization and specialists tend to live in the city. Okay. All right. Um, so what leads to the decline of cities? I probably should have put that uh, in, in green because then the decline of cities should be in red, but that's okay. Okay, so um, pretty obvious ones here. A lot of political instability uh, will be an issue. It's kind of just the opposite of some of these, uh, which political instability tends to lead to outside invasions or is caused by, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Right, the disease that's going to happen with the Black Plague is going to really create some instability. Uh, and then lastly, of course, the decline of farming productivity, which will lead to less specialization, less, you know, safe, um, uh, safe um, food supply, uh, which is going to lead to people kind of retreating from the city, especially if they need to farm themselves, right? Okay, let's talk about the effects of the Crusades. Kind of one of our uh, other our our major cultural interaction points, even though it is a, a series of wars, right? Um, so one of the things is uh, we see increased demand for non-European goods in Europe, right? Which makes uh, uh, they start to kind of get this taste of outside outside wares, outside luxuries, right? Is a big deal. Um, they also then open themselves up to disease. Right, because of the Crusades, they are exposed to the Black Plague, also known as the Black Death, uh, in Europe, which was going to kill uh, 25 million people in Europe, potentially. Right, um, And so with that drastic decrease in population, right, we basically see the crumbling of the feudal system. Right, Because uh, the feudal system really depends upon the, the strong... Uh, a strong base of serfs, right? Uh, and when those serfs are all dead, right, all of a sudden this whole system kind of collapses as the lower, or excuse me, the higher vassals and lords and kings will not get enough tax revenue or enough food revenue, right, and stuff like that, okay? Um, and so that also leads to a lot of conflict within Europe as well, um, right? And then uh, on top of all this, right, the, um, the um, exposure to new ideas from the Byzantines and the Muslims, right, will lead to the rise of the secularism, right, the, and not necessarily anti-religion, but certainly the idea that it's not all about religion, uh, secularism and uh, the rise eventually of the Renaissance, right, the rebirth of Greek and Roman culture, which of course is heavily, heavily influenced by um, the, the Muslim scholars kind of keeping all of the Greek writings from previous eras. So um, there are three key travelers to know about during this time period. The first, probably most famous, uh, is Marco Polo. Um, he visits China uh, and he kind of returns. He's a merchant. Uh, he visits China. Uh, he gets arrested and I believe Genoa as he's a Venetian merchant uh, and they're kind of trade rivals. And so in Genoa, he kind of tells this whole story to another prisoner who writes it all down and creates these books, right? Um, so, uh, he, he kind of, he visits China and kind of, we'll just say he writes it down for, for simplicity's sake. Uh, but a lot of people simply don't believe him at first that it's as nice as it is. And so when other missionaries or, uh, merchants, uh, when other merchants and missionaries travel to China, uh, to kind of see what the fuss is all about, right, we see it lead to an increase in demand, um, not only for Chinese goods, but also for travel to China. Right. Um, okay. And so we see an increase in trade uh, with China due to Marco Polo's writing. Okay. Uh, between China and Europe. Okay. Um, 
possibly more important, probably as important as Ibn Battuta, uh, who is, um, he is a Muslim scholar. Uh, he is a Muslim scholar, uh, and his goal is to visit uh, the all visit all of the world of Islam, right? The house of Islam, uh, Dar al Islam, right? That's kind of his goal, which is you know quite a lot of Eurasia at this time. Uh, they kind of went through his different areas: Central Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, China, Spain, North Africa, Mali, right? Um, he's going there to really help create to to um, make sure that Sharia law is being followed. Um, we read in our other textbook a lot about him being very anti. Uh, African culture, right? The the kind of syncretic blend of African culture with with Islam, um, especially in the role of with the role of women, right? Um, and so um, they don't really talk about his influence, right? But what he does is really help um, uh, help us understand uh, the different cultures within Islam, right? And helps kind of spread those ideas uh, to the wider Muslim world. Okay, um, and the last one, this is a new one for this year, uh, is the, um, the English woman, Marjorie Kemp, uh, a mystic. Um, she might be the first autobi had the first English autobiography. Um, she went to Jerusalem, Rome, Germany, and Spain, so kind of around the Christian world, right? Um, and it is the first kind of hand, the first first-hand account of a medieval woman's life, right? Um, and so, um, not too much more to say about her or any of these travelers, but each of these travelers really did influence people being much more interested by other cultures and other ideas, right, outside of their own kind of insular culture, right? And so that's about it for the cultural consequence connectivity. There's quite a lot here, um, but yeah, that'll do it. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you in the